Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for your patience. We appreciate you waiting as we worked out some last-minute technical glitches with our uh, webinar technology today. Welcome to the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association webinar entitled Below the Surface, Using Yoga to Treat Complex Trauma with Heather Champion, a licensed mental health counselor and registered yoga teacher. This is the sixth webinar for our 2019 Emerging Issues in Mental Health Counseling webinar series. My name is Aaron Norton, and I'm the chair of our Education, Training Standards, and Continuing Education Committee. I'll be the moderator today. So I'm going to launch a couple quick polling questions here to get a sense of who's in the audience and uh, what you're mostly interested in about our learning objectives today. The first polling question is on your screen. Everybody except for the presenter can see it now. Question is, which of the following describes you? And you can select more than one option if you'd like. Your options are A, licensed mental health professional, B, registered intern, C, counseling student, D, counselor educator, or E, other. 73% of you are licensed uh, mental health professionals, 18% counseling students, 18% other, and then 9% registered interns. Okay. So then second polling question is, which of the following learning objectives are you most interested in hearing about today? Number one, understand the etiology of trauma. Number two, understand the neurological effects of trauma. Three, understand the history and components of yoga. And then finally, four, understand how yoga heals neurological effects of the trauma. Wow, overwhelmingly, you are interested in item number four. 92% of you said, understand how yoga heals neurological effects of trauma. 8% um, said, understand the etiology of trauma. All right, so that is good information for us to know about. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce today's presenter. Heather Champion is a licensed mental health counselor. She obtained a master's degree in mental health counseling from Adelphi University in Garden City, New York in 2013. She's worked in a variety of settings, helping individuals with a variety of needs, but finds her niche working with those working through life transitions, such as finding sobriety. Her expertise is in diagnostics and insight-oriented interventions that help clients develop interceptive awareness or mindfulness. Heather is a registered yoga teacher, RYT 200, and has received additional training in trauma-sensitive yoga, TSY, and principle-based partner yoga, PBPY. She's an expert in somatic processing and uses this methodology to assist her clients in resolving anxiety related to complex trauma. Heather has been developing a variety of group and individual interventions that combine the elements of a yoga practice with psychotherapy to help survivors of trauma process the unspeakable through movement and or meditation. Prior to her career in mental health, Heather received a master's degree in industrial organizational psychology from Hofstra University in 2003 and a bachelor's degree in psychology from Stony Brook University in 1998. She worked for many years as an efficiencies expert in corporate America before transitioning to her current role. And Heather, just so you're aware, in a moment, when I'm done introducing you, I'll be um, taking off my webcam, but I'll be here the whole time. So if you ever need anything, just uh, call out for me and I'll, I'll uh, assist. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Heather Champion. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to um, Florida Mental Health Counselors Association for allowing me to do this today. It's something that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, and I've been working through it for working on this stuff for quite some time. Um, I like to call this presentation below the surface. I do it a lot for my clients and I also um, have started developing a program for yoga teachers to help them recognize somebody with trauma or complex trauma that might be coming into the studio um, that might need some specialized care. Um, so I'm trying to get this my my presentation to work. Hopefully you guys can see the screen. So um, here is a like we said before some of my background. Um, I did get my bachelor's at Stonebrook in '98, and then I got my master's in industrial organizational psychology at Hofstra in 2003. Um, what I became um, at that point was an efficiencies expert, and I really did a lot of systems analysis. I was uh, I would look at both the hard and the soft systems in a lot of different organizations and see what um, what could be done better and look at the inputs, the process, and the outputs of all those systems. Um, after some time doing that, I decided it wasn't what I really wanted to do. So then I went back to school and I got my degree in um, mental health counseling. The thing about it was though, that while I was a systems analyst, um, I discovered yoga in a really deep way and got really into my practice and also um, into really interested in the mind-body connection. So while I was going to grad school, I actually 
actually started my studies in the two combined, both the, the physical and the, um, the mental aspects of where things come together. My program did not actually have anything in particular that would help me to develop this further. So at the same time while I was going to get my master's degree, I was also doing my um, RYT to get my yoga teacher certification, got my, certified, my fitness instructor certification, and as well as got a couple of extra certifications in trauma-sensitive and principle-based partner yoga. So that's how this stuff all kind of comes together. Um, but I look at things in a really uh, systems-oriented way. And so when we talk, when I talk about some of the concepts that I use in, um, in my work, um, we're going to see, you might notice like the systems analyst background because I worked a lot in IT. I think about the brain as like a master supercomputer. Um, and so hopefully that my, the, the way that I kind of talk about that stuff will resonate with some of you out there. Um, all right. So hopefully what we're going to do today is to help you to understand some of the ideology of trauma um, and how I define it um, as a professional working with tr people with um, significant trauma um, and also start to understand the neurological effects of trauma, um, the history and the components of yoga, and then how we can pull those things together, how we can look at the components of yoga and help to heal some of the neurological effects in, uh, of trauma. Um, so the way I like to define trauma is, is an experience um, where a person ex has three main elements. Um, I call this my, the trauma triangle. And basically, uh, trauma is the situation where first, there is no choice, where the individual has no uh, choice whether they can or they can't um, experience it. And really, this is an individualized way of looking at the situation, where you and I might look at somebody else's situation and say, well, they had the choice whether they, they did or they didn't want to be in the situation at that time they could have left but in the individual's mind in that specific situation they did not have the choice to to actually experience it the experience also has no value to them they don't understand why it's happening to them they go uh, uh, they're looking at the situation and saying this bear, there's bears no representation in anything that i believe or anything that's happening to me um, and then the third element is that the individual needs to somehow suppress what they're experiencing so their natural response the physiological responses that we have to anxiety and fear have to be suppressed in order to sit in order to get through that situation. We can see this kind of start at a very young age because you know, infants and children, they don't have the choice of whether they get to experience things and they kind of don't understand what's going on around them for the most part, unless we as the grown-ups sit down and talk to them about it. So when we look at complex trauma, we're really looking at the idea that you know the children in these situations are not, they don't have a choice, they don't, they don't understand what's going on, and they feel like in some sense they need to suppress how they're feeling in that situation. This creates some of what we're going to look at in a little bit about the, uh, the physiological changes in their bodies and their minds. So the way I like to uh, explain it, like I said, is the suppression of emotional responses in the physio and the physiological responses to our emotions. All of our emotions have some physiological response within our bodies. And when somebody's experiencing trauma, they have to suppress that in order to get through the situation, or at least they feel like they have to. This creates a separation between neuroception and interoception. So neuroception is the un the uh, the <laughs> the neural process that subconsciously evaluates risk in our environments and it runs through the viscera and it basically through our, our tummies and our um, a digestive system so when you get that nervous belly feeling that's what's going on in there that is a natural it's an automatic process it's not one that we can control interoception is the sense that uh, how we know what's happening in our bodies at any point in time so if I'm walking someplace and I start to feel kind of nervous my hands are shaking my stomach starts to quiver it's the ability to kind of look at that and say, oh, I'm, I'm nervous right now. I'm about to walk into doing a big presentation. Um, when there is a separation between those two, then we start to see some of the effects of trauma that we're going to be looking at. Um, the two systems usually work together, like I said, but when we consciously have to suppress the acknowledgement of how we feel, they start to separate and not work together anymore.
Like I said before, the lack of choice, the individual cannot choose to experience the event. There is no escape, or at least there is no perceived escape, where somebody might, somebody else might say they can get out of that situation. The individual as they're experiencing it does not see the escape in the situation. It, these things will evoke the adrenaline response. And the adrenaline response is shaking, sweating, nausea, dry mouth, faster breathing, heart palpitations, and dizziness. Now, if I'm going into a situation where showing any of that might get me make the situation worse, that's when I need to suppress these things going on. Those are the natural physiological reactions to whatever's happening to me. Um, the person for survival can, in the event, can't, um, but the physiological response must be suppressed. So they can't run, they can't scream, they can't cry, they can't do anything. So for an example for this, what I what I like to think about is like that, that child who's sitting there, their parent comes home from school or from work or whatever, and they're screaming and yelling and they're carrying on. And the child has learned in that situation that if I sit very quiet and I don't show how scared I am of who's sitting, who's coming in this room and screaming at me, that my parent will calm down and then they would they will take care of me. So the child starts to learn to behave in this way. And in that situation, this is where we start to see the complex trauma developing. Um, this does create, though, the dissociation or out-of-body experience when the body reacts and we're trying to suppress that or hold ourselves as still as possible so it doesn't further excite or anger our parent. Um, when these automatic processes kick off, though, it, they tend to be interpreted by us as my body failing my mind. Um, I might, I'm trying to tell my body to stay still and don't shake or don't cry or don't do whatever, and I'm still doing it. And so there's this disconnection. I can't control what's going on. The events have no meaning. So like I said, the little the child who's sitting there with their parent coming home um, from work and the parent's really angry about what happened at work. But the child now thinks that this situation is being created because of something that they did. They don't understand the overall meaning of the situation. Um, it creates a feeling of loneliness and disconnection within the individual who's experiencing it. So whether it be complex trauma or an acute trauma event further on down the line, we're still seeing that sense of disconnection and loneliness that the cutting off from other human beings. Social support and connection of others is a protective factor against trauma. Um, and that's where our, the, the difference between secure and insecure attachment really comes in. Faith in higher powers or universal universal intelligence can also help as a connection um, in, to culture or community. If I believe that these things are happening to me because there's a higher power that's involved, then, it, then it's easier to manage it. I can see that there's some sort of a meaning and I may not know what it is now, but I might know it further on. But the thing is that the event does not align with my culture or my community um, understandings um, that will create those feelings of disconnection. So I break, I break trauma down, like I said, into two different um, basic categories. Complex trauma is ex traumatic experiences prior to adolescence um, in starting kind of in infancy. So we can start to see some of the patterns that, that, that develop in some of these individuals with, with complex trauma from things like having a parent, having a mother with postpartum depression can create some of this to start out. The reason why I like to call it complex trauma or it is referred to as complex trauma is because is the, the trauma that's experienced, it may not be a life or death situation as far as we might consider it, but what it does is it shapes the, it shapes the internal fabric of how this individual sees themselves. So as a child, and I know that I have to be quiet and I have to be perfect or these things are going on, that complex trauma starts to develop and it comes into this fabric of I need to be perfect all the time, I need to, I need to do things a very specific way. Um, so Insecure attachment styles, neglect, verbal abuse, any of those types of things really come in when we talk about complex trauma. Acute trauma would be a very specific point in time. It would be a single event, um, and it happens after adolescence because after adolescence, we're kind of developed into who we are and how we're going to be. Our, our internal fabric is basically set at that point, and it can't really change. Of course, a complex event where it's happening over a long period of time will probably start to change that internal compass of how we see ourselves. Um, but an acute trauma would be that specific point in time, like a car crash, a mugging, a rape, or something along those lines. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the neurological effects of trauma and how the trauma experiences change the neurological processing of typical behavior patterns for those who experience trauma. 
So when people experience trauma, the brain then takes that information and encodes it somatically as physical sensations within the body and as fragmented images stored in the deep recesses of the brain. It has little association to anything else in that part of the brain. So the way I like to explain to my clients when we're going through this is imagine somebody took a mirror and dropped it on the floor and all these little fragments reflect back the same image of whatever's on the ceiling or on the walls around you, but the images are fragmented. You can't really put those images together. So our brain takes the experience of trauma and then shoots it just like those fragmented pieces of mirror all over the place in our brains. It doesn't take a lot to trigger them, but it's whatever it's nearby is how it's going to get triggered. It's also uh, stored in physically in specific areas of the body. So somatically, we're, we associate the experience with whatever we were feeling physically. Some of those physical responses to stress and anxiety would come up at that point. They're not encoded with words because they're encoded in the part of the brain, the more primal part of the brain that does not have words associated with it. So we're not we're not encoding the experience with any type of words or verbal processing. They're stored in stored in nonverbal sections of the brain associated with those physical sensations that are tied to the experience. The fragments of the trauma are then triggered by somatic or physical experiences, and then the adrenaline response will kick up as a bottom-up response to danger. So that's when we start to talk about this uh, polyvagal theory. Polyvagal theory basically says that there's two branches in the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is what runs down our spine. It connects the cerebellum to the rest of our organs through the spinal column. Um, there's three phylogenic states in the autonomic mm -hmm. nervous system that are behaviorally linked to social engagement. The first being social communication. So it's our most highest order of processing. When we think about the social engagement system, that is the last part of our brain to develop and it's the most complex part of the brain to develop. The social engagement system um, will suppress the sympathetic nervous system when we feel like we are in a safe environment. However, when we feel like when through the viscera we experience um, a lack of safety, then what happens is that that sense, that system starts to get suppressed and then our, our the sympathetic nervous system or the adrenaline response will then kick into action. The third level of this is immobilization. So it's the most prim primitive part of the brain and it's the most primitive system. It's where we basically just faint. Um, so when I'm explaining this to some of my clients, the way I like to explain it is imagine there's a bus accident and there's a bunch of people on the bus. Some of the people on the bus are able to stay kind of present and get up and walk around and talk to people and make sure everybody's okay. There are a group of people on the bus who are probably sitting there screaming or kind of in shock and there's a group of people that have fainted. And those are our three levels of our stress response system. When our environment is deemed safe by the body, our viscera deems the situation as being stay, safe, the body remains in a state of calmness or visceral homeostasis. So I don't have butterflies in my belly, my hands feel okay, everything is good. That state decreases our heart rate and inhibits the um, SNS and dampens the stress response of the hippocampal pituitary axis or the HPA. So that keeps us kind of verbally talking to other people and reaching out for verbal help when we recognize it. However, when we drop down into those other levels, we go into automatic processes. So here's a night, here's a um, illustration of how this kind of works. Um, if you look at the bottom, the visceral organs, um, the visceral organs is like the stomach and all the digestive organs. If the visceral organs kind of notice that everything is cool, um, they're going to push the senses out and say, okay, we're in a, go a good place right now. We're in safety mode and everything is working okay. This entire system really can bypass the cortex and the gray matter in the brain. It's only the amygdala and the hippocampus that's really getting involved in that. And that's our basically our watchtower or what kind of controls and watches for um, danger. When the fear when the fear response comes in, it immobilizes that social engagement system and we're not able to really see what's going on as far as socially is concerned. We're just looking to, to, to um, get through the situation as, as, as well as possible. When we look at the three levels of the, auto, of the system, um, the first level being our autonomic 
uh, nervous system, or that social engagement system. That's where I have conscious control over what's going on around me. I can talk, I can reach out for help, I can use all of my faculties to the best of my ability, my gray matter or my, I'm consciously controlling what's happening in my body. When we drop into that second level, the limbic system or that fight or flight response, these are automatic processes and they run through the spinal column. We don't have control over that. Again, the third level is that parasympathetic, that's the nerve or uh, that's the nerve, the freezer collapse. Um, so according to polyvagal theory, neuroception is the neural process that's capable of sub subconsciously evaluating risk in the environment via the restora and the vagal pathways. The vagus nerve connects the brain stem regulatory sensors with muscles in the face, the throat, the middle ear, and the voice back via the ventral vagal complex. So what's happening here is this natural system, the automatic system that the vagus nerve controls, controls how we socially respond. It's the system that when you're walking down the street and somebody smiles at you and you smile back, that's kicking in. When we are in what, when our, our the hippocampal um, pituitary axis notices danger or the vestibular notices danger, that system starts to get suppressed. The complex functions, uh, this complex functions as a filter that limits social stimuli, like observing facial features and listening to human voice. So when it's being suppressed, we're not able to hear that somebody is telling us that they're trying to help us to get to a better place. Um, they're trying to help us to get out of the danger. And also determines engagement within the social environment. So like I said before, when people are in some sort of danger, they cut off that com the, the communication with others and they just try to run and find safety on their own. The source nuclei of the nerves are located in the brain stem um, and they communicate directly with the inhibitory neural system. So we do not have conscious control over this. It runs up and down the brain stem. This is a picture of what the ventral vagal complex kind of looks like with the sympathetic and the parasympathetic um, uh, nervous systems. So what it's doing is it's pulling, pulling some of the signals in from the, through, through our entire digestive tract. The other thing that it's doing is it's controlling our vision, it's controlling the salivation, it's also controlling how we breathe and how our heart rate works. This is really important information for us to remember when we start talking about yoga, yoga principles and yoga philosophy and how these things can all help one another. Um, according to polyvagal theory, the nervous system, um, it gets damaged after somebody has experienced trauma in the areas that control our ability to determine safety and risk. It basically gets recalibrated. It's looking at things a little bit differently, where I got through this kind of uh, really difficult experience in the past, and this is how, um, so now I have to recalibrate and look for things a little bit differently. In people with complex trauma, where they've kind of grown up with this environment where they've had somebody that they can't really depend on, um, they don't know what's going to come through the door the next time. For them, their system is really recalibrated. They have this internal working model of who they are and how they see the world that's based in that old time period. Um, and so this really affects their ability to experience, you know, connection with other people, reciprocity, and feel safe in their environments. Um, connection or social support is the most powerful protection against becoming overwhelmed by stress and trauma, which we, we all know when we study trauma, that people with really good social connections and social, so social systems really do better when they experience trauma. It's the biggest protective factor against trauma. If two people walk into the same environment, one gets traumatized and is experiencing PTSD afterwards and the other one is not, usually the one thing that's the, the, the differentiating factor is the social support system versus no social support system. Reciprocity means being truly heard and seen in other in the people around us. Um, it's a feeling, it's a real feeling of connection that we're being held in someone's mind and heart, and it means it, it means that we're connected. So if somebody is truly seeing me and hearing me, then I feel it sense of connection with them. That gets broken when people experience trauma because of the recalibration of the system. When we feel connected, we feel seen, heard, and safe. When we don't feel connected, we don't feel seen, heard, or safe. Interoception is the sense of the internal state of the body. It encompasses the brain's uh, process of integrating signals relayed from the body into specific subregions, allowing for a nuanced representation of the physiological state of the body. It's important for maintaining homeostatic conditions in the body, potentially aiding in self-awareness. So this is our ability. It's basically mindfulness. It's our ability to notice what's happening in our bodies. 
Those who experience trauma show a decrease in interoceptive awareness. They can't read what's happening in their own bodies. In an effort to shut down the uncomfortable physical feelings that accompany uh, terror, trauma victims shut down their entire system for sensing. Um, and they renders them incapable of registering any internal processes. We can see that in some of the effects of trauma, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, due to the lack of connectivity between the limbic system and the higher order processes, trauma survivors tend to feel unsafe in their bodies because they cannot make sense of what's happening. You can imagine if you're sitting there in a room and all of a sudden you start to shake and your stomach starts to quiver and you can't talk right, you start to feel really uncomfortable. You don't know why that's happening. You start to feel really, really unsafe. It's really scary, like what's going on in my body right now. A process makes trauma survivors more susceptible to being hijacked by the limbic system. Have you ever seen somebody being triggered into trauma? They're really being hijacked by that limbic system. They can't focus. They can't be there in the moment. They don't know what's going on around them. And so they start to act really impulsively. And they might even engage in a bunch of self-harm behaviors, such as you know, using mind-altering substances, cutting, shopping, sex, anything like that, which really come in in these types of situations. Um, the lack of interoceptive awareness can be translated into the term alexithymia, when you can't give words um, to your feelings. Um, the brain literally can't connect some of that lower order processing of feeling to the higher order processing of words. When we talk about people who have experienced trauma, we see a lot of them have ale alexithymia, which is the inability to distinguish one's feelings from the accompanied bodily sensations, com um, communicate those feelings to others in externally oriented cognitive features reflecting the absence of inner thoughts or, or fantasies. These are individuals who is extremely concrete. If you ever worked in substance use disorder treatment, you've seen a lot of these people coming in. They have difficulty identifying their and describing their feelings. They have difficulty distinguishing their feelings from their bodily sensations. So what that essentially means is that when you ask them, what does it feel like? What does it feel like in their body to experience anxiety? They're going to start talking about, they're going to start talking about being nervous. They're not going to talk about the physical manifestations of what anxiety feels like in their body and vice versa. If I ask them, what does it feel like? <laughs> what does anxiety feel like? They're really having a hard time identifying the physical and the um, and the emotional. They cannot separate them, and they get them kind of backwards when we talk about them. Diminution of fantasy means that they just cannot um, think about things in a different way. They're super concrete thinkers, and there's not a lot of introspection. They really can't look at themselves. They have a really hard time with what's called error analysis or error processing or planning. This is highly correlated with substance use disorder, elevated stress response, and insecure attachment. So these things are really all together. We look at insecure attachment as being one of the one of the factors involved in complex trauma and also involved in the elevated stress response. We're also seeing that this is all tied together. Um, those who experience trauma tend to embody a really specific set of features due to the damage occurred in the brain and also to their sense of self. Those features include the affective limitations or incongruence, hyperarousal, personal rules for behavior, post poor social interactions, limited self-reflection or error processing, and limited planning. So this section of the, um, of the presentation I actually put together for, for yoga teachers so they can recognize people that are coming into the studio that might need a little bit more TLC or some um, extra special care. When we talk about affective limitations or incongruence, um, it's when the affect of the individual's uh, expression of, if, in, I'm sorry, affect is an individual expression of an experienced emotion or how we can tell from the outside what they're feeling. Trauma survivors present with affective limitations or incongruence. This means that in a lot of times what they say they're feeling and what we can kind of sense them feeling are two very different things. Um, the way I kind of like to explain it is like when somebody comes in and says, you know, I'm so happy right now. This is the greatest day. With this completely flat affect, or they're talking about how depressed they are with this like happy, perky um, affect on, where we they they definitely just don't do not go together. A lot of times, you know, in in regular social interactions, it's going to look like somebody's being really fake or insincere. If I say that I'm really sad, but I'm I'm presenting as really perky, then it's going to come off as super fake or insincere. Um, is expressed not just in their body language, but also their speech, their cadence, their tone, their vocabulary, and their eye contact. 
The limitations occur to the disconnection between the feeling and sensing portions of the brain and thinking speaking portions of the brain. Often survivors of trauma are fearful of sharing their difficulty in reading themselves and others, creating a need to kind of put on a happy face despite their feelings of sadness and disconnection. Unfortunately, that fake or insincere face that they display creates a larger chasm between the feelings they are actually experiencing in their conscious minds. And they can be so habituated to living a fake and disconnected ex existence that a connection here is nearly impossible. I see this a lot when I, when I get clients coming through um, that are a little bit older and have very much habituated themselves to just suppressing everything that's going on. Having them go below the surface and understand that life exists um, in, in a kind of a in a, in a more emotional place, they have a very, very difficult time and they have such a hard time kind of tying these things together. And with hyperarousal, um, the survivors of trauma are on heightened alert 24 seven due to the overactivation of the SNS. Due, due to the damage in the brain and sensing systems, they're unable to identify danger appropriately and thus need to be on lookout. This is that recalibration that we we're talking about of their systems. It can manifest as exaggerated startle response, tenseness in the shoulder, back, and hips, racing thoughts, headaches, tiredness, impulsive negative behaviors such as lashing out, yelling, or physical attacks, or isolation such as shyness, lack of eye contact, or withdrawal from social contact. These things tend to happen because the system is just so overloaded. Personal moral behaviors is one of my favorite ones that shows up all the time in trauma treatment or in substance substance use treatment. Um, it's when people come in and say, I can't do that. It's not something I can do. It's I'm putting myself in my little box and I'm going to keep myself safe in my box. So survivors of trauma often create these rules about what they can and can't do. And in their minds, the rules are going to keep them safe. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is they have these rules that they put them into, put themselves into their boxes and they trap themselves with their trauma and their pain. Um, it's in, often manifested as an inability to play, explore, or try something new. Survivors can appear very rigid, stubborn, and stubborn when asked to step outside of their comfort zone. Often the rules don't make any sense to outsiders, and I see this a lot when I'm trying to encourage people, let's say in a yoga class or something, that we're working on trauma, trying to get them to move with, outside their comfort zone and getting them to kind of explore a little bit more. It doesn't make any sense why they're so scared, why they won't do it. The other thing that we tend to see is really poor social interactions. Uh, due to all those preceding symptoms, um, not being able to read themselves, not being able to read others, um, they're in it. They have they they're completely unable to accurately read social cues, um, and they have poor social skills when interacting with general population of individuals. It can be manifested in a lot of different ways. Um, one of them would be isolation, withdrawal withdrawal or shyness, standing within a group and not contributing to the conversation. This is one that I, I point out a lot to yoga teachers to notice when there's a group of people sitting there talking and there's one person just sitting there kind of awkwardly following the conversation but not really saying something, saying anything. The person probably has a little bit of trauma in their background. Babbling, over talking, or being really hyperverbal. Um, another symptom, they're just not reading social cues. They don't know what's important, what if anybody's actually listening to them because they're not able to read those social cues. Oversharing, providing personal details that are inappropriate to, uh, to the discussion. Another thing that we see a lot, a lot of times trauma victims will walk into a situation and they'll share their trauma and they'll say, here's all my pain, please help me. When in actuality, it kind of looks like, here's all my pain, now abuse me with it over sexualized conversations um, and also extremely short attention span. People they just can't stay focused um, on the conversation. They kind of appear to have like ADHD, but it's really just the hyper arousal. They're just noticing everything that's going on around them all the time. Essentially, um, behavior in any extreme could be a symptom. And I remember the first time I did this um, presentation for some of my clients, one of the um, individuals in the audience said to me, well, Heather, is that why when people smile at me, I just stare at them? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. You don't know how to read that and you don't know how to react to it. And we have to get you to a place where you're going to be able to do that. Um, some of the other things that we see is poor self-reflection and error processing. So with poor self-reflection, um, it's kind of tied to alexithymia and is expressed in the concrete thinking and, and external locus of control. Um, our awareness is the ability to consciously perceive one's own mistake and fairly to achieve the intended goal of an action. A lot of times when people that come in with some severe trauma or some de uh, development or a complex trauma, they have a really hard time understanding that they 
cause the things to go wrong in their, their worlds and in their environments. They have a lack of introspection or interoceptive awareness. They can't read what's going on in their environment and they think everything happens to them and that's kind of expressed through that external locus of control. They're unable to observe the error in their actions when their intended consequences are not observed. So they tend to think that if I wanted this to happen and it did not happen, it's because of something else. It's not because I did something wrong. They usually blame others um, or the situation, but not the self. If there is any self-blame, they're unable to forgive themselves. So if they I recognize, well, I did this wrong, they have a lot of anger and resentment towards themselves and they can't, they, they have a really hard time forgiving themselves for what happened. They're also really, because of the, the lack of introspection, they're really bad to read external and internal cues and plan for the future. They just kind of go through things in kind of an impulsive way, um, kind of bumble their way through things and, and can't really learn from the experiences. The overreaction, Overactivation of the SNS, the um, individual tends to look very impulsive. The SNS controls the automatic or impulsive actions that happen within the body. Um, it works that way for safety. The brain's too slow to formulate a response in a high stress situation where quick action is required for safety. So imagine you know something's flying at your head. You don't want to sit there and wait for your brain to verbally think about, oh, there's something flying at my head right now. Maybe I should do something about it. The automatic system needs to put up the hand or duck or do whatever naturally you're going to do to avoid getting hit in the head. So the system is meant to be automatic and it's meant to save us. But because trauma survivors have a damage sensitivity to danger, they're not often um, operating with this SNS that's working the way that it's designed. It's usually overactivated and it's looking for any type of danger in the environment, which really stresses the system out. It'll activate actions that are well rehearsed or easily accessible in this situation as a means of escape. So a lot of times when we're working with people with substance use disorder, their SNS gets activated, they want to go and use because that's the, um, that's the action that they're most rehearsed and they're most comfortable with doing. Many of the symptoms can be observed in those seeking uh, treatment for substance use disorder, eating disorder, and borderline personality disorder, regardless of their past specific traumatic experiences. Evidence suggests that attachment style at the age of two years can predict the use of maladaptive coping strategies. It's hypothesized that, at the same, that the same structures in the brain that are damaged from trauma are also damaged if there is a lack of adaptive parenting, reciprocity, and mirroring infancy. Uh, the medial prefrontal cortex, or MPFC, anterior cingulate, and parietal cortex are all, all involved in this. The other part of the brain that's highly involved in all of these processing is the insula of the insular cortex, which I believe has um, a role in error processing, planning, and then the integration of the body and the mind sensing systems. Um, there isn't. There is still a lot of research going on in all of these different areas, but um, this evidence seems to be pointing that all of these things tied together in the insular cortex. Um, so, in summary, on the neurological event, effects of trauma, the damage created in the brain separates the cognitive processes, those upper-level processes of thinking, giving words to my experience, from the physical and emotional feelings. So we still are not able to tie those two things together. Trauma will separate them. The brain development um, plays a major role in determining how much of an individual self-concept is defined by the trauma and how deeply embedded the trauma lives in the individual psyche. So the earlier these things start to happen, the more they're developing into the, the, uh, the, the sense of who this individual is. Central to the communication is the insula, as it appears to translate sensations from the body into the other higher order processing in the brain. And to help manage the trauma, um, I believe that we need to help individuals feel safe and activate the upper level processing so they can start to verbalize what's happening to them. If they're always in a state of stress and shock, then they're not going to be able to really work through or process any of that trauma. So now I'm going to go quickly through um, yoga and yoga yoga principles. Um, typically, I think that when most people think of yoga, they think of basically what's here on the screen, which is uh, a picture of me on the beach many, many years ago doing yoga. Um, this is not necessarily yoga. It's just one aspect of yoga. Yoga um, means, it's a Sanskrit word, Sanskrit's the ancient language that predates um, Hindi, which is spoken currently in India. Yoga means to yoke or to tie together and bring together. 
Um, yoga was first transcribed around 1200 BCE in the Vedas, which are ancient Hindu texts believed to have originally been lyrical hymns that were passed down orally. So the, um, the origins of these things probably go back even before 1200 BC. Specifically discuss, yoga is specifically discussed in the Upanishads, which is teachings of finding one true self through God. And that was probably transcribed between 800 and 600 BCE. The earliest uh, description um, of yoga was in the Bhagavad Gita, which translates to the Song of the Lord, uh, and it lays out the branches in the phil philosophy of yoga. But modern Western yoga is specifically described in the Yoga Sutra by Panjali. Panjali formally gathered up the practices of yoga into an ordered and consistent system, which now we refer to as the eight limbs of yoga. The eight limbs of yoga um, are broken down first into the yamas and the niyamas. The yamas are our abstinences and the niyamas are our observances. There are five each, with the first one of the yamas being ahimsa, which means nonviolence or abstaining from hurting yourself or other people. The next one being satya, which is non-lying or abstaining from lying to yourself or others. Astya is non-stealing or abstaining from taking things that don't belong to you. Brahmachara means control, moderation, and temperance. And in the, the classical writings, it kind of um, alludes more to um, being faithful to your spouse or being faithful to your God, if you're, if you're in that, if you're like a monk or whatever. Um, it's kind of a difficult translation, and that's why I don't have it listed out as a non-something or other, but it means basically control, moderation, and temperance. Um, Aparigraha means non-hoarding, and that means just abstaining from having more than you need. The niyamas are the things that we do, or our observances. Uh, first one being saucha, which means purity of mind and of body. Uh, santosha means contentment and acceptance of our present moment. Tapa means lust for life and practice, a drive to continually improve ourselves. And pranatara means self-education, mean consistently learning and growing, learning about myself and about other things. Ishvara pranana means dedication to a higher power. And what that kind of uh, translates to is understanding that we're part of something that's bigger than ourselves, that the world does not revolve around me and I don't live in a happy little bubble. Those are just the two um, yamas and niyamas. The rest of the eight limbs of yoga um, really focus on more of what most people think about of yoga. Pranayama it means um, um, breath restriction. So prana, the word prana means life force and yama means restriction. Um, and if my life force, life force is my breath, then pranayama will be breath restriction or breathing techniques or breathing exercises. Um, asana is the physical practice of uh, postures. And that's what I think most people really uh, think of when they think of yoga. Pratyahara, it means withdrawal of the senses. Um, so while we're practicing any of these things, we kind of withdraw our senses in and we focus on just what's happening. Um, dharana is the focus of a meditation and dhyana is the overall meditation. So really we've got three limbs of the, um, of the eight limbs of yoga that really focus on meditation. And then samadhi being the highest part, um, it's one was with the universe or a sense of enlightenment. Um, and what in ancient times people practiced yoga to reach samadhi. The way we kind of like to think about it is that the yamas and the niyamas are the roots of the tree, and we need those roots in order to ground ourselves and to grow strong. Pranayama and asana um, then come up and they make the tree nice and strong so that we can go ahead and focus on our meditation practice to eventually reach the oneness with the universe. Um, when we think about incorporating these things into uh, psychotherapy practice and helping people to heal using these concepts, um, I really like to first think about um, helping using these things to help people feel safe in the environment, especially in, their ther in the therapy office or whatever environment we're going to be doing the therapy. Um, the way I like to teach it is that it starts with the therapist qualities. And if the therapist embodies the yamas and the niyamas, really those, those basic core um, pieces of how to be a therapist, um, see something flashing, hold on. Sorry, I just noticed something flashing on the screen. Um, if the therapist is really embodying the yamas and the niyamas, really what they're doing is they're teaching um, the individuals how to do these things for themselves. Um, 
So the first thing being kindness or ahimsa, um, which we can teach as a therapist through our actions and our interpretations of emotions and situations. So one of the things I like to say a lot to my clients is it's okay that you feel that way, they're your feelings. Helping them to, um, to, to show themselves some kindness. Like it's okay to be who we are, it's okay to feel what we feel. Um, I would expect, given your situation, that you would feel that way about what's happening to you. Um, in my groups and in my um, in my therapy uh, offices, I call them should and supposed free zones because those words really bring um, a lack of kindness to ourselves. We, when we're using those words, we're telling ourselves that we're not good enough. We should be doing better. We're supposed to be doing better. So that's some of the things that how we bring up, how we can bring ahimsa into the therapy office and into that situation, whether it be in a group or an individual setting. The other thing that we can bring in would be honesty or satya, not hiding the truth. So a lot of my clients tell me I can be kind of brutal with um, telling them what I think of that, what's going on in their lives. Um, I will tell them straight out, you know, what, what you're doing doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand why you're doing this. Or um, can you tell me in a different way? Because what I'm hearing you say is something really, really weird. Um, or being true, completely, truly, and honest with them, like you're kidding yourself. This is not the way. It, it's not what's going on. You're lying to yourself. These types of things. I'm truly, really honest while being kind at the same time to my clients, and they really enjoy that um, in the therapy office and in in the group setting because they they know that they can depend on me. I'm always going to be there. I'm always going to be nurturing them. I'm always going to be helping them, but I'm also going to always be honest with them. Um, bringing control of brahmachara into the therapy office means regardless of how they present, you always remain calm and controlled. You're always the same. Work with people with like, um, let's say borderline personality disorder. And it's something that we absolutely have got to do. We have to be controlled. We cannot allow their mood swings to drive how we're action, how we're acting. But if we bring that into all of our clients and we, we are like that all the time then we're really teaching them that we're trustworthy and they can they can work with us um if we bring in acceptance or santosha um we're meeting them where they are um it is what it is this is how the situation is this is what's going on we can't go back and change the past we can learn from it though and really helping them to understand how to accept i accept you for who you are and what you're doing right now i may not like it but i accept you i accept what's happening for you right now i'd like to bring uh tapas in um through lust for my own lust for life um some self-disclosure sometimes i'll talk about um excitement and interest in that therapeutic process where they kind of start giggling where i walk in and say well, well I, I can't wait to hear about the latest things that have happened to you what's going on um it makes them happy or i'll tell them about you know something that um, I, I saw or I read or something that was going on in, in my life and I kind of step in with a little bit of excitement that they get to be there and I get to see them and I, I'm happy to have them um, in my world at that point in time. And it really helps them to bring that energy level up. Um, with self-education of Pranatara, um, I'm constantly talking about learning and educating both myself and them. And a lot of times, you know, like I'll have a client come in, especially when you're working in the substance abuse world, you'll have a client come in and they'll start talking about something, some new drug that's out there or some new whatever that's out there. I'm always fully, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Can you explain it to me? Can you teach me about that? That's not something that's, you know, within my scope of, of expertise. Um, I like to share things that I've read. If I read a really cool article, I'll bring it in and I'll, I'll share it with um, share it with my clients all the time because learning and educating myself is really important and I want to help them to learn how to do that for themselves as well. The connection um, is through reciprocity. And I think that's probably the most important thing, most, most important aspect of yoga that we can bring into the therapy office. Um, help them feel connected, encouraging them to continue working. But let, let them know that they're safe here and that you see them and you hear them. I don't like to tell people how, what they're thinking and what they're feeling. I like to tell them what I'm hearing. 
When I do that, I'm explaining, I'm, I'm showing reciprocity. I'm showing them that I'm hearing what they're saying. Well, what I'm hearing you say right now is that you're pretty scared about this situation. Is that, is that, am I, do I have that right? And then we can talk about a lot of that stuff. Um, letting them know that the space is there for them to learn, to connect, and to interact so they can build a skill set for the outside world. Um, to connect with the other people in a group setting with the other people. Bring stuff here, let's talk about it all together, and then let's try to figure it out as a group. That connection, that looking around, that knowing that other people are listening to you, and bringing that in constantly really helps people to grow, to learn what's going on inside of them, and to be able to use some of the skills that they're learning in the therapy office outside. When we look at interventions, um, specific interventions, um, what I like to do as far as helping the, the clients to develop an internal understanding through the reflection, through analysis and discussion. So when I'm bringing a lot of my psycho, bringing yoga in with psychotherapy, what we're really doing is focusing on some of those internal processes. So if we think about what happens when people experience trauma, we notice that separation between the thinking and the feeling parts of the brain. If you're in my office and I'm making you through the way that I'm interacting with you feel safe, then we're able to stay in that verbal processing place. We're able to stay up there and you're not in fight or flight. So then what we're able to start to do is to think about, well, what's happening in my body right now and how do I feel? So one of the first pieces of psychoeducation, once I know that we're kind of in a good place and we're understanding one another and we're able to talk and we're still in that verbal processing place, we start to work on the physical symptoms of different psychiatric uh, diagnoses and then also emotion. So when we talk about going below the surface, like the title of this, uh, this talk, we're going underneath the, the really superficial and the concrete stuff. We're talking about what feelings live underneath here and really drive the behavior. When we start doing some of these things, we start to notice that there's other emotions that are being suppressed that we're not dealing with at all. And so once we start doing, um, doing psychoeducation on the specific emotions and what all these different emotions feel like, all of a sudden we start to notice that the, the clients are able to identify much more emotion than what's going on. Typically, we get people into the therapy office um, that have some trauma in the background, and they're able to identify like two or three emotions, like anger and sadness usually are the two big ones that they're able to identify pretty easily. There's a lot more emotion that's going on in there. And so when we start working on the primary versus the secondary emotions, like we have five primary emotions and they're all tied to the feeling of loneliness. And loneliness is the one thing that an infant can really feel. And that's why that trauma triangle help holds on to you know the feeling of that connection that's what really comes out of it is the feeling of connection and loneliness is, is the most painful um, emotion that we can experience but it has a very specific set of physical sensations that go along with it and we work on trying to identify you know the primary the, the thing that's at the deepest level that we're experiencing and then the secondary emotions usually when they're presenting for treatment all we are able to identify really is those secondary emotions especially anger anger is the one that we're able to identify the, 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 the most clear um, one of the other things that I really, really like to do is to help them to learn about themselves and help them to understand that both their diagnoses and um, the physical sensations that go along with their diagnoses. So a lot of times we'll do some psychoed on the physical symptoms of you know, depression versus anxiety. What does it feel like to have depression? What does it feel like in my body? We talk about some of those symptoms so that maybe we'll be able to identify that I'm feeling depressed or I'm feeling anxious. When I when we kind of go into this stuff, I have them really think about what's happening in their body, really helping them to connect in a safe environment, their thinking and their sensing parts of their bodies. That way we can kind of predict a little bit of what's going on in there. So a spe specific intervention um, that I've developed is called emotionally, what I call emotionally therapeutic yoga. So what we do in emotionally therapeutic yoga, remember um, we do some um, trauma sensitive stuff in there. Um, it's a yoga class plus ex an existential psych psychotherapy group. So we're talking about what's happening in the moment for each of the individuals in the, in the group. We're doing a couple of 
of physical exercises, so actual yoga practice, actual yoga exercises. Of course, they are um, segmented or broken down into things that are not going to evoke any type of a trauma experience. So if you have any experience with specific postures or breathing exercises that might bring up some trauma, might trigger some people, we avoid those types of things. We leave them out. Basically stick with the basic breathing exercise of a diaphragmic breath and then a few simple exercises to help us to open the shoulders and the hips up a little bit and build up some strength. The other things that we're going to do is like some standing postures. We're really focusing on where the feet are. So what we're doing in those exercises, number one, is we're releasing some of the somatic stuff that sits with us after we experience some pain and trauma. Usually the pain and the trauma sits in our shoulders, our neck, and then in our hips and our lower backs. So we kind of focus on feeling what's going on there, recognizing, tensing, and then, and then releasing, and what that does and what that feels like in our bodies. And then we're also doing some grounding exercises, really looking at the feet and recognizing where my feet are. And one of the things I really like to do with them is to talk about how my feet are on the floor and the floor will always support me, which is something that a lot of a lot of people who have experienced trauma won't think, don't think in that way. They don't think, well, yeah, the feet are, my feet are on the floor, my feet are connected to the floor, the floor will always support me, the floor is always going to be there. Even if I fall out of an airplane, eventually the floor will be there probably what helped me and be very supportive at that point in time, but you get the idea. We're also focusing on um, some psychoeducation um, and space to let them discuss what's going on. So when we do a breathing exercise, we do a simple body work exercise, we start to talk about like, well, what happened? What was that like for you? you know, if you feel awkward, let's talk about why it feels awkward. Um, the other thing that we're really focusing on is listening to the body and reconnecting the thinking with the feeling. So one of the things that I noticed a lot when I work with trauma survivors and, and kind of bringing in type of yogic interventions in, especially body work exercises, is because that disconnection is there between the sensing and the thinking, people tend to push their bodies into places where they really does not need to go and injure themselves. And when I talk about this stuff with them, um, I talk about myself because I have a few yogic injuries. I do have some trauma in my own background um, and I've learned to work through it. And because of some of that disconnection that I experienced, I have old injuries that I have to be very mindful of. And I talk to them about it and I talk to them about it in real terms, really bring that self-disclosure in and let them know, like, listen, I I've been there, I've injured myself and I have to be very careful. And this is what I'm teaching you guys to do and that's the reason why I'm teaching it to you because I don't want to see, see that happen to you. There's been other instances where I was working with people that, you know, in a more, in, in the mind tree group, which we'll get to in a minute, um, where they did injure themselves in a very, very simple seated position, you know, in a chair. But the thing is that those individuals they, um, they had some really significant trauma. And through experiencing the trauma, they really, they really disengaged from their bodies. They had some pretty severe dissociation. So when I'm teaching the postures to these guys, to my clients, um, I kind of will, I will kind of play with them a little bit and I'll show them, you know, I've been practicing yoga for like 25 years. There's a lot that I can do that the average person isn't going to be able to do. The thing is though, that they, um, I sh I'll show it to them and say, you're not going to be able to do this. And I'll give them the instructions of keeping their chest open and keeping their back straight and doing this and that and being really mindful of what's happening in their body. And then they go and they try to get to the end point. And then I'll point out to them, um, why are you, your shoulders are rounded? Why are your shoulders rounded? I said to keep the chest open. If you keep the chest open, then you can't do this, can you? No. Oh, and does it hurt? Yeah. Then why are you going to do it? Oh, I didn't think about that. I saw you do it like that and I wanted to do it too. Yeah, but what else did I say? I said, if it hurts, if you start to round, if you start to do this, pay attention to what's happening in your own body. A lot of the, a lot of times we'll sit and we'll just process just that action of trying to do what the teacher's doing and I'll trick them into it and I'll tell them ahead of time. I'm going to show you some stuff that I can do that you can't do and I don't want you to try to do it. And then I turn around and they're all doing it and I'm like, what are you guys doing? Stop doing that. That's where also that honesty is coming in where I'm like, I knew that you wouldn't be able to do it and I wanted to see that you would learn and hear me. Um, and not do what um, I told you not to do, even though I showed you to do it. And let's 
bring some of this back together. Um, what we tend to find with um, the emotionally therapeutic yoga is that we start to see a real increase in pro-social behavior and also the ability to notice what's happening and make better decisions. Um, it's not an overnight thing, but within a couple of months and within like three to four sessions, we definitely see that massive increase in pro-social behavior and also the decision-making process. Um, anything with meditation and grounding would also be appropriate way of bringing things in. So um, I like to focus on what's called vipassana meditation. And vipassana means insight. So if we're doing any type of insight building, a vipassana medication, uh, <laughs> meditation, um, would be really helpful and really good for the individuals. Um, vipassana really means just noticing what's happening. So one of my favorite vipassana meditations was talked to me by my teacher uh, Dharma Mitra many years ago. And what he says to us when we're doing, um, when, when we're meditating is just close your eyes and focus on what's happening on the inside of your forehead. Notice where your thoughts go, but don't engage in them. And that's one of the ones I will often teach. There's also um, a plethora of other vipassana or insight meditations where all we're really doing is training the brain to notice and not engage. So we might sit in quiet solitude and, and notice that there's somebody walking down the hallway, but let's not try to, let's try not to engage the thought process of who is that, what are they doing, why are they here, um, are they here to see me, are they not here to see me? All that internal verbiage that we tend to go through when we're trying to be quiet. Just practice being quiet, trap practice, just noticing what's going on. Sometimes um, there's, a, there's a bunch of different um, visualizations that can go with that, that can help people to kind of get through that experience of five to 10 minutes of just sitting there and noticing and letting things go. Um, after the fact, whenever I work on a Vipassana meditation with a group, um, I will often sit there and ask them to, to discuss what happens when you close your eyes and you try to do this. Did you try to do what I was telling you to do or did you decide to do your own thing and why was that? Um, and we kind of go through the experience of what that was like. Um, so a specific intervention that I wrote when I was in grad school um, was the Maitri group, um, M-A-I-T-R-I -I is pr pronounced Maitri. Um, and with Maitri group, um, Maitri is based um, in loving kindness for the self. Um, and basically what we're doing in it is we're trying to increase the internal understanding of who we are and what we're doing. So with the Maitri group, um, when I developed it, I was working um, back in New York in a outpatient mental health, um, general mental health clinic um, in our catchment area was a very poor and depressed area. Majority of our clients um, had, were on Medicaid or Medicare and due to either physical or financial restrictions were really unable to, to engage in a yoga practice. So I developed the Maitri group to bring yoga to them in a way that is also psychotherapy. So the Maitri group is an eight week closed group. Um, it's an existential psychotherapy group. So we're focusing on the present moment combined with a Hatha Yoga class. And a Hatha Yoga class has basically three elements to it. We have um, our opening kind of mantra, we have a breath exercise, we have our bodywork exercise, and then at the end we'll usually end with um, a meditation, which we usually call a Shavasana. So basically we're bringing those elements into a existential psychotherapy class or talk psychotherapy group so that we're kind of talking about each of these pieces as they happen. But the first part of every group being the mantra meditation of the blessing of loving kindness. Um, and it's a uh, kind of a Buddhist chant or a uh, mantra that repeats. And each time I repeat a stanza, we take, shift the focus from myself to my family, to my teachers, to my friends, to my enemies, and then all sentient beings. And it kind of sounds like a prayer when we recite it all together. And we practice the idea of reciting a mantra and reciting it all together. After we recite the mantra, we really sit and talk about like, well, what's that like for you to sit here and to, to recite this and to listen and hear all these other voices going along with you? Um, then we would go into a breath exercise, a pranayama exercise. Um, in, there are eight separate ones in the protocol for this Maitri group. 
Um, then after that, we would move into a gentle bodywork exercise. So with the breath and the bodywork, what we're doing, we're just doing one of each, but what we're doing is each week building on what we learned in the previous week. So the first, um, the first session is where we're working on what's called the balanced breath. So breathing in for the same interval that we're breathing out and then getting that kind of focus in and learning how to belly breathe and breathe, you know, with the abdominals to get more air in and understanding why we're doing it that way. And the body work exercise is really just noticing what's happening in the body, very uh, focusing on like what it feels like to have my feet specifically on the floor and noticing what that sensation is like for me. As we go through, we get more involved in the breath and the body work exercises where some of them, you know, are kind of silly. There's one called happy breath where you swing your arms up in the air and you do all this stuff and it makes everybody laugh. Um, and each week we kind of build and we, we add more to it. Same thing with the meditation. All the meditations are Vipassana meditations in nature, but they look at the Vipassana in a slightly different way. Like I said, sometimes we could use different types of um, visualizations to help us to under to help us to um, process the idea of letting things go. Where one of them is where you notice you think about your thoughts and your feelings and things that are coming up as little clouds that are going through a sky. Um, there's another one where we look at them as their ripples in the stream. Where there's another one where we look at them in a slightly different way where we note them or we label them. All these different types of vipassana meditations. In the beginning we start with a noting and labeling um, vipassana meditation. And by the end of the eight weeks, we're doing bodywork exercises, we're doing um, breathwork exercises that involve some movement, and then we're also doing a really, you know, kind of a hard meditation where we're just kind of turning everything off and then noticing what happens. Um, and so each week, the group members um, start to build their skill set in how to use any of these. And we talk about how they, um, what their experiences are like and then um, how they might incorporate this into their daily and weekly lives. Um, it tends to be really, really helpful for a variety of different people and a variety of different issues. I remember once I taught some of these breathing exercises to a woman who was um, had really bad bipolar disorder and her her son had um, severe autism, and she felt that some of the like crazy breathing exercises with swinging her arms up in the air really helped her to calm down. And so her and her she taught them to her son with autism, and the two of them would do them. And she's like, oh yeah, we're standing there waiting for the bus and we're doing these exercises and help us calm down because the bus is late. Um, and I you know I always laugh at that one because uh, that's one of the exercises I tell them, you may not want to do that one while waiting for the bus. And she's like, I don't care, it helps, it's gonna work for me. Um, I had another woman who went through all eight weeks of the course with me um, and she had some cardiovascular issues and ended up being taken to the ER and the ER doctor came to her and said, you know, you really need to lower your heart rate. And so she started to do some of the breathing exercises and the, the, um, the, the Vipassana meditations that we did in group. And she was able to lower her heart rate. And the doctor said, how did you do that? I don't understand how you did that. Um, and she said, what's my secret? You can't, I, can't I, I won't tell you. And she was really proud of herself because she was never really able to control anything like that um, before. So through these different exercises, what we're really able to do is to help people to come out of that SNS response, out of the adrenaline response and control what's happening in their lives and around them. And we remember back to the polyvagal theory, um, the picture of um, the different systems that are involved. The only system out of all of that stuff in the visceral pathways that is controllable by me um, or our minds is our breath our breath, I can't control my heart rate, I can't control my digestion, I can't control any of those things, but I can control my breath. And so as we start to teach people the breath control and how to, um, how to change the breath patterns, then we're able to start to teach them stuff like that one client did, where she was able to reduce her pulse rate to a point where she was able to, where the doctors felt comfortable actually treating her in the ER. And they were amazed with the um, with what she was able to do. She was really proud of herself. And I remember after she got out of the hospital, she came and she told me, she's like, I have to tell you something very special. The other thing about these exercises, the bodywork exercises are simple and easy enough where you can do it with people with some physical issues, um, with some general um, 
um, caveats. Um, so it was in this group when I was doing um, when I was doing particular exercises where I observed how people with severe trauma in their background tend to really separate the physical from um, the, the actual thinking part of the brain. And um, in one of these exercises, we were doing a very simple spinal twist, um, which is just kind of turning around in your chair. The thing is that the chair had arms in it and I decided um, to show them the deeper twist because I really wanted to crack my back that day. The thing is though that we did it on both sides and we came back and we talked about, you know, what what the experience was like and one of the girls in the, in the group um, had experienced some pretty severe trauma something close to um, the movie precious um, what her childhood was like uh, and she was sitting there and she started noticing that she had some really severe pain in her back and so as we sat there for a good 15 minutes trying to figure out where the pain was coming from in her back and then how she got it what she realized that she had done is she saw me crack my back using the arms in my chair and she decided to do it too. And even though I was telling her, if you notice any pain, then come out. And I keep note, I always note that whenever I teach a yoga class. But the thing is that her brain heard it, but her body did not do it. And she recognized that she was putting herself into pain by yanking herself like, like I had done. Um, and so we really start really process how she had that disconnection. Another time we were doing a very simple kind of forward fold. Um, and one of my clients decided with, she's got some priests, she had some pretty severe issues with her, with her lumbar spine to reach for the floor. That was the app. That was the last part of the intervention that I was teaching to reach for the floor. But she decided to reach for the floor, which was fine until she decided to come up. And she sat there and she's crying in pain because he the tears running down her face. And he said, what happened? She said, well, you said reach for the floor if you can. And I said, but you can't reach for the floor. She's like, I can reach for the floor. I just can't come back up. And I said, well, does this translate to your life at all? And she said, absolutely. She's like, I'm always pushing myself too far and never thinking about the ramifications of my actions. There was another woman in the group, the actual, the one who was able to lower her heart rate in the ER um, using the breath work that she had learned. She had decided that she was only taking that particular posture to the beginning stage and didn't really get into it all the way. When we got into it and we talked about it, she said, I really didn't feel anything with that stretch. And I said, well, what do you think that is? She said to me, because I only pushed, I didn't go all the way in because I was afraid. I was afraid that I was going to hurt myself. And I said, do you do that a lot in your life? Do you not push yourself and not put yourself out there afraid of being hurt so you don't experience anything she's like i do it all the time and so for both of those individuals we were able to really turn that into some new work to do um, through their individual psychotherapy that we pulled out of that group so we're tying together you know the emotional effects of the trauma the fear the inability to experiment the inability to notice what's going on in their body the inability to plan and the inability to look back on mistakes um, so the last thing that um, I've most recently kind of developed is what I call my tree of wisdom or the wisdom tree. My clients love to call it the wisdom tree. They refer to their wisdom trees as something that really helps them to understand themselves. And so basically what the wisdom tree um, is, it's very similar to a safety plan, but I've kind of changed it around a little bit to really um, embody some of the aspects of yoga and the aspects of psychotherapy that, are, uh, that the clients really need to help themselves. I break the wisdom tree down into four main sections. The first one being satya or truth. And so what we focus on in satya is my internal triggers. Now if we go back and we kind of talk about my tree, M-A-I-T-R-I, um, the from the Maitri group, it means to have um, universal loving kindness for myself. And part of my tree is being honest with myself. And so with satya or the truth, my internal triggers, the things that really get me into trouble, these are the things that I try to hide from myself. And when we do all the analysis into um, what the internal triggers are, which is a completely different set of, a, a, its own set of um, interventions that I do with my clients, um, what we discover is the stuff that's underneath the surface that we're not paying attention to and we have completely um, pushed away. Um, so when we work on the satya, when we work on the truth, we really work on the things that are under the surface that we're not paying attention to, they get us into the most trouble. 
The next section that we identify is my karuna or my compassion for myself. And we, those are my internal coping strategies. A lot of the times what we use in that section are just reframing questions. They're just you know basic DBT reframing questions um, to help if I'm feeling, let's say, loneliness is or disconnection is my main big trigger, if I'm feeling lonely and disconnected, what are some of the things that, if I notice that's going on for me, um, what are some of the things that I can do to kind of resolve that or help myself feel a little bit better in that moment? The next section would be my sangha or my community. Um, and those would be all the external supports. So it'd be like my social supports and my, and my professional supports. And the last section would be the environment of my rules for behavior. So this is different from the rules of behavior that we see that keep me trapped in my trauma. These are the rules for behavior that are gonna keep me safe from my trauma. I break down Satya into three smaller sections, which we've kind of we've been kind of been talking about a little bit. So we identify those specific emotions that cause me the most trouble, that make the world look super different, that basically put me into the automatic the SNS. Um, put me into that adrenaline response. Those emotions, we try to identify them before it gets to that point where I fall into that level. Um, but the thing is that usually those emotions are so big and so powerful that we don't even realize that we're experiencing them. So then we start talking about the physical manifestations of those emotions. So here we're tying that together, that it, the upper level processing with the thinking and feeling parts of the brain, we're pulling this all together so that they're able to identify, okay, well, when my when my heart's racing and, and, and I feel kind of like achy in my back, that means that I feel, you know, sad or I feel angry, I feel lonely. And that's when I can know what's going on for me. And then we also identify, well, how do I typically act from experiencing that emotion? And I use the example of myself is sometimes I'm really angry, I get in the car and I start driving like a lunatic. And I said, I stop and I look and I go, oh my God, like, why am I driving like this? And I know that the only time I drive like that is when I'm really angry about something. And so then I have to stop and think, what am I so angry about? What's causing me to be like this? Um, and we all have them. We all have these little things, these little tells on how somebody can tell what my emotion is and what I'm experiencing. For that particular um, portion of um, the, the tree of wisdom, I tell them to go back to their family members and ask them. I'm like, my mom would always know when I was a kid, when my hypoglycemia was getting bad and I needed to go and eat something. So she would hand me a piece of cheese and tell me to take a nap and come back in 10 minutes and then talk to her. Um, she always could tell when I was getting snippy or was getting, you know, kind of cranky because probably that was the issue. So our family members always know um, really well how to read those things in us. Once we're able to get all that stuff together, um, what we use is error processing to identify these specific emotions. So remember that like, people that have experienced trauma, especially complex trauma, have a really, really hard time with error analysis um, and planning. So what we're doing here with Satya in the Satya section is we're really trying to think about things in a non-judgmental way. Um, I have them identify situations where they did something that looking back on it could have been handled in a better way. So we kind of think about it as a regret, but I tell them don't think about it as like a gigantic issue because usually there's so many different pieces to it, it takes us forever to figure out what the trigger emotion or what the trigger event was. So pick something that's small, you know, got angry at the grocery store and you know, yelled at somebody. That's a really easy one to talk about and to help us to pinpoint what's going on. Um, what we do with that is that we start to identify the emotions that they experience at the point where they made the, the decision to act and do the thing that, that they look back on and think probably shouldn't have done that. Then we use um, the thoughts and these thoughts and feelings flashcards to help them to identify additional emotions. So we, I put up a card, I say yes or no, was this something you might've been dealing with? And then we put it down on the table. And we make a big, uh, full table full of emotions. And at that point, usually we're able to see like, wow, you said you were angry at that point, but there's like 15 emotions sitting here. So obviously it was a little bit more than anger that was going on. And we kind of talk about how they were not able to identify it, even in a calm, safe place, all these other emotions that were happening when we misbehaved or when we did something that looking back on it, we could think of a better way to handle it. 
Then what we start to do is to pair off the emotions and the cards, and then eventually put the pairs together in larger um, conglomerations. So we call, so we create what I like to consider a cascade of emotions. And what we're doing with that is we're physically taking the cards and manipulating them so it's easier for the more concrete thinkers to understand what we're doing, tying them together so that we can better understand what the trigger emotion might be. Um, what really caused the poor behavior pattern. Um, and then usually what we'll start to talk about is which of those emotions were really suppressed. You didn't identify any of these, and even after this point is probably when you hit your point of no return. Which ones are the ones that really, really give you a hard time? Then we'll start to talk about how they showed up for that person in that particular situation and translate them to other situations that they may have been experiencing this stuff. Um, from there, we're able to really come up with their trigger emotions, and then I have a couple of different things that I do to help them to identify how it fit, how those trigger emotions physically feel in the body and how they act when they experience them. Once we get there, we start putting together some of the other um, safety plan items that you know, would be like my coping skills um, and my support systems. For the rules for behavior taking into account the people, places, and things that might put somebody in danger if they're experiencing a trigger emotion, and we restate them in a positive way. So it, to explain that better, I'll tell a story about one of my former clients um, a while back in an inpatient treatment facility. She came in um, and she, uh, she was back on a scholarship. She had been with us for a month. She left for a month. She relapsed. She came right back. Um, we scholarship her back because it had been less than a month since she had left us. Um, and in the second instance that she was with us, um, our, our clinical team decided that she was going to come under me and work with me. So she, you know, she said, yeah, I'm going home. I'm going to do everything. I'm going to do everything I'm supposed to do. Uh, and she was really a great part of our community at that point in time. She was doing all the work that she was supposed to be doing, everything that I was assigning her. They made her a peer leader and she was leading groups and she was leading meetings and things like that. But the thing is that as usually happens in an inpatient treatment facility, some people came in, shenanigans started happening. And we noticed that she was kind of close to the center of it. We believe that her roommate was probably the one that was causing all these shenanigans. And so I called her and I said, well, you're a pure leader. You're supposed to be, you know, give us the dirt on what's going on. She's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And she continued like that. And then she started withdrawing more and more and more and uh, not interacting with the rest of the rest of the population, the rest of the groups. She also stopped doing a lot of her treatment work. And as an added bonus, started wearing more and more makeup. And by the time I kind of really um, confronted her on this, um, I, I always joke around, I say that she looked like a drag queen with the amount of makeup she had on her face. When she first came into treatment, she wasn't wearing any makeup. And like a week and a half in, you know, she was wearing enough, uh, enough makeup to, you know, go be in the gay pride parade. So I sat her down and I said, you know what, you're here on a scholarship. Um, you don't have any, uh, any, you don't do anything. So I can't take anything away from you as far as um, the privileges, because you don't use any of your privileges. So what we had, the clinical team had decided to do was to take her makeup away from her. I said, you wear a lot of makeup. You're going to give your makeup up. We're going to do a no makeup challenge for you. And once you start doing the things that, you know, you, you were doing when you first came in here, and you know, you're supposed to be doing, then, um, then you'll get your makeup back. So she gave me her makeup bag and she, and we locked up, we put it in my desk drawer and the next day I came into work and she's still wearing makeup. So I sat her down and I said, you know, what's, the, what, what's with the makeup? So I'll, I thought you were kidding. I didn't know you're being serious. She, and then she turned around and I said, well, give me the rest of the makeup. And she gave me some more makeup. Day three come in. She's still wearing makeup. So I, I said, set her down with my, my clinical director at the time. And um, we kind of talked to her about it. I said, listen, you're here on a scholarship. You were given a very simple instruction of not wearing makeup. You're not doing it. So basically at this point, if you do not give up all that makeup, um, you're discharged. We're not going to keep you here anymore because obviously you're not doing anything. So uh, myself and one of the techs went into her off, went to her room, made her wash her face, and she's crying and she's pulling makeup out from in between the cushions in her bed. She had taped some of it underneath a um, a desk drawer. She had stashed them more, you know, behind something else. It was almost like she had stashed her drugs someplace in the room. Um, my my coworker and I are looking at her using the makeup like a drug here. 
anyway, we, um, after a couple of days, she sat and cried that day and she, you know, carried on like a lunatic about it. Um, and after she calmed herself down, I sat down and I talked to her about it. And I said, well, what happened here? She's like, you know what? That's what my last relapse was like. She said, um, one of my roommates, was sneaking around and doing stuff with her boyfriend she wasn't supposed to be doing. And I had connected with the other girls in the house, but then when that started happening because I had to hide what she was doing, I started to withdraw myself and the makeup got really heavy and heavier and heavier. And then she started to engage in a lot of her um, um, her behaviors that were really, really bad, really dangerous behaviors before she relapsed. And she said that the makeup craving was a really early trigger and a really, really, an early, really early warning sign. And she was on her way to re-engage in a bunch of very um, poor behaviors. So for her, what we ended up doing in that rules for behavior section was we set up a rule that if she wanted her makeup, she had to talk to two different people to get it. And the house manager in her halfway house kept the makeup locked up. So she had to go through her mom and her halfway manager in order to get to the makeup. She could always go ahead and go out into the world and buy more makeup because she was going to get a job like she always did and was probably going to be somewhat financially successful. But the thing is that with that rule in place, it would bring to mind and help her to remember, hey, makeup's a trigger for me. If I'm craving my makeup, there might be something I need to deal with. Maybe I go need to talk to somebody that um, I trust or can help me. Um, and so that's how we use those rules for behavior. We know that makeup is an issue for her. We set it up as a positive thing. You know, in order to wear makeup, I have to talk to my mom and my house manager. That's all it is. It's a very simple thing. It's something that she can follow. She doesn't have to always follow it, but if she really wants to maintain her sobriety and, and feel good about herself, then she's probably going to need to do that. So with that, um, I'm going to offer up some of my resources, um, some references, some of the uh, places where I found a lot of good information throughout my, um, throughout my career so far, going to school, um, and also um, things that I like to kind of lean on to build some of these interventions for my clients. Um, so I have currently the two um, books of my own that I have three listed there. The, the, the one for 2019 is very close to being finished and published. Um, I, um, I self-publish on Kindle. Um, so you can go into Amazon.com and search for my name, Heather Champion, and you'll come up with the two books that are listed here, the My Tree Therapy Workbook and the Yoga Psychotherapy Guide. Those two books, um, the My Tree Therapy Workbook is the entire course, um, the eight weeks for My Tree. Um, and it can be kind of conducted by just about anybody. I put instructions in there and there's, um, it's, it's designed as a workbook for clients, but you can also use it for yourself if you wanted to incorporate that into um, your psychotherapy practice. Um, the Yoga and Psychotherapy Guide, um, it provides you with um, information on the yamas, the niyamas, the eight limbs of yoga, and it also gives some instructions on how to build um, specific psychotherapeutic interventions using mindfulness, using Vipassana meditations, and using um, breathing exercises. Um, there are a selection of uh, meditations in there. There's a selection of breathing exercises in there, and there's some um, pre-made interventions that um, that you can use if you do so, if you think that it might be helpful for you. The My Tree Insight Oriented Psychotherapy book is um, a much larger resource. It's got um, a, it's a curated um, combination of all different interventions that I've written and put together using a variety of different techniques. Some of them use a little bit of DBT, some of them use a little bit of CBT, but all of them are working towards building insight and building um, kind of this idea of mindfulness or interoceptive awareness where we're really noticing what's happening inside and how what's outside is affecting me. Um, the other books that are listed here, um, When Things Fall Apart by Pema Chodron is one of my favorite books. Um, working in the recovery field, I find that that book is really amazing. It really helps people to uh, deal with fear. Um, the Feeling of What Happens is about uh, interoceptive awareness by Antonio Damasio. Um, and it's a really interesting look at you know the research behind um, neuroscience and how we know that we are alive. Um, Overcoming Trauma Through Yoga is part of the uh, Trauma Sensitive Yoga program by David Emerson. So if you decide to do some sort of, if you would just want to use that resource, um, it is a book. They have a lot of great 
exercises in it. Uh, Bo Forbes' book, Yoga for Emotional Balance, is also really good. It has more physical exercises in it, and she breaks it down between anxiety and depression, some of the physical exercises. They're more restorative in nature, not a lot of movement, more just like sitting still with um, whatever's happening for us. Meditations from the Mat is a great resource for um, for those in recovery, um, it's 365 meditations or little excerpts that were written by Ralph Gates, who's also in recovery, and used yoga to really help him through his recovery. And he kind of combines the two in some of these things. And there's one for each day of the year. So those are kind of fun to bring in if you're doing like group therapy, if you want to like have a meditation for the day. Um, Light on Yoga by BKS Iyengar is the uh, gold standard in the Bible for yogis. Um, if you need more information about, um, about yoga, yoga philosophy, um, or any yoga postures, um, that is the Bible that us yoga teachers like to use. Meditation and Yoga and Psychotherapy by Simpkins and Simpkins is a great resource if you're looking to incorporate some of these things together. Um, they go into some of the um, psychotherapy principles that are touched on with yoga and different types of meditation. They give some um, examples of things that you can do in there. Um, my absolute favorite book of all time is The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Um, a lot of the what I've, what I, I've talked about in this um, this webinar is really based in his work. Ironically, I developed a lot of this stuff with before the book came out, and when the book came out, I noticed that a lot of the stuff came together really nicely, and the book really explained a lot of the things that I do and why it's really helpful. Um, another book that I really, really love is called Therapeutic Com Communication by Paul Wachtel, um, and it was something that I had to read for my master's degree um, many moons ago. However, um, it really helps to hone in on building reciprocity and building the sense that you know the client really feels like they're being seen and heard in, in, in the therapeutic environment. Um, other opportunities, um, trauma-sensitive yoga, um, the website is up there. I got my um, a 40 hour cer certificate from them um, at the Corpalo Institute um, several years ago. Um, it was actually during Hurricane Sandy um, up there. It was kind of interesting. Bessel Randall Colt came and spoke, so it was a really uh, great experience. Um, they, um, the trauma center where that that runs the training is located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and they sometimes go on the road, but they're kind of an international organization. And the last I checked, they're not coming to Florida. You can always go to Cambridge and get additional training, or you can go on their website. They do some web training as well. The other thing that I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit is my or insight oriented psychotherapy. Um, so basically what I've decided to do um, in addition to the books that I've put out is to start education, uh, psychotherapist ed training education where everything we talked about here will be gone into in a lot more elaborate detail, kind of like a, uh, a certificate course. We're in the pro I'm in the process of writing the course out and um, applying with the state with CE broker so that I can uh, give CEUs and actual certificates um, in it. And what I'll be doing in that um, is uh, providing psycho psychoeducation on trauma in the brain, just like we were talking about, but in a lot more detail. Um, education on yoga and yoga pr yoga principles, again, just like we were talking about here, but in a lot more detail. And then really working through the specific interventions and situational analyses. So the different interventions that I kind of went over will be trained in detail and how to do them, um, as well as everything that's in my books, the three books that I had talked about with the third one coming out very, very soon. Um, I'm also working with the yoga, t yoga teacher training program to build um, a training program for the emotional therapeutic yoga classes that, um, that I kind of developed and I teach down here in Palm Beach County. Um, so that we can teach that also as an, as an adjunct um, for yoga teachers to be able to really help people with emotional processing through yoga um, specifically. Because a lot of the uh, therapeutic programs that involve yoga, it's more physical therapy rather than emotional therapy. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to teach yoga teachers to really how to, how to integrate that and to be more integral with all that stuff. 
Um, if you would like to contact me, um, this is my phone number, my email, my website, my Facebook, and my Instagram. Um, fortunately, Facebook and Instagram are a little bit quiet on because I do work quite a bit, so I don't get um, I don't get out there very often in social media. But um, if you do want to follow me, those are the ways that you can follow me. If you're interested in the training program or you want to find out more about um, some of the books that I have coming out or already out, you can go to my website or you can email me, um, heather at mytreetherapy.com. All right, so this is a lot of information, Heather. I am do not actually see any questions yet from our members, um, which I'm hoping is a, another great sign that you've been very clear with the information that you've provided. But folks, if you do have questions, um, please do not hesitate to enter them in as we have a few more minutes that we could uh, entertain some questions with. I do see that we have a raised hand from an attendee. Um, but actually know that hand has just been lowered. So I think we are <laughs> set so far. Um, while, it, go ahead and enter a question if you have any folks, but while we're waiting on that, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a little bit of information and some reminders here. Just a friendly reminder to complete the webinar evaluation form, which will appear on your screen after I'm done talking. And if you miss it, you'll have that second opportunity um, as we'll be sending a follow-up email in about one hour um, that will also have a link to that survey. And you must do that survey today so that we can report your attendance tonight or tomorrow morning into CE Broker. And uh, we also hope that you'll join us for our next presentation in our 2019 Emerging Issues in Mental Health Counseling webinar series. It's entitled, A Unified Partnership Between Attorney and Mental Health Counselor. And it's with Adam Rawson, Esquire, an attorney, uh, here in Florida on Friday, uh, July 26th from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. And to register, please feel free to visit us at fmhca.org. We do have a couple, a few questions that have come in since um, uh, we first asked for them. Uh, Barbara has asked, is there a connection between the vasal, uh, I think vagal, medical issues that some people have where they faint? and having not worked on their trauma issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of psychosomatic um, issues that we see that are tied to um, past trauma experiences. Um, I know that um, as part of the, uh, the, the, the experience of trauma, the lowest level of that uh, response system is to faint. Um, and so those who are having fainting experiences like that, it's a vagal tone thing that is causing it, but it's usually because that stress response system is so overloaded that it just crashes. It's like when you have your computer doing way too much stuff and it just dies out and crashes on you. It's the same type of thing that's happening in the brain. Um, but the thing is that it's happening um, not in the gray matter of the brain, but it's happening along the brain stem, which is that vagal tone. There is also a question here from Denise, who says, you mentioned that older clients are somewhat reluctant to share or express their emotions. Do you think this might be something that is generational? Sometimes it is. I know that a lot of my um, my older clients that I work with, they, they'll say, well, I never had to do this before. Um, it's not something I'm used to doing. Um, but the thing is that a lot of times what we find is that the clients um, grew up in a world where they weren't really allowed to talk about their thoughts and feelings um, or that was really suppressed and so they learned how to kind of like just push that away and not really deal with it and they got so good at it that they were never able to identify anything that happened ever again. So some of it is generational um, but I think a lot of it is just more um, the community and, that we're growing up in and the environment that we're growing up in, is whether that's really like, talking about how they feel is part of it or not. All right, and uh, David says, thank you, Heather. He works with uh, PTS and PTSD with law enforcement personnel, and he's gonna be sending you an email. He wanted to discuss something with you. All right, I think that is it for our questions and comments. So. Um, Heather, thank you so very much for a very yeah. interesting, oh wait, here we go. Uh, there is another one that just came in, it looks like. Um, do you think this therapy is appropriate for all cultures? 
I do. I think one of the things that I really try to do when I'm when I'm laying this stuff out is I keep my Sanskrit to a minimum. One of the th actually, ironically, one of the things when I was doing my yoga teacher training, I got docked for all the time was the Sanskrit because I could never pronounce anything properly with my Sanskrit. So as a yoga teacher, I usually stay away from using Sanskrit to explain things. And when I try to explain the concepts, I try to explain them as an as a much of an Americanized way as possible and put it into plain kind of everyday language. Um, I also really like to use Pema Chodron's talking um, and teachings because she's really amazing at bringing things down to a really, taking all these concepts of like Buddhism and yoga and all that stuff and bringing it down to like everyday life. Um, and having, uh, helping people to understand like how these things really are integrated into everyday life. So I get a lot of people that might have a little bit of resistance, you know, to some of the stuff that I'm teaching them. But when we bring it down to everyday life, it really is able to translate well. All right, looks like your low battery message is coming just in time. We got through the webinar, huh? <laughs> um, Barbara says, thank you, awesome job, Heather. Yannette has asked where um, we can find the recorded video. We will, if you complete the evaluation form, then you will get a follow-up email that will include a link. It may take a couple of days though, because we do some editing on the video. And so everyone who completes the evaluation form will get that link. Well, Heather, thank you so much for a very interesting and engaging presentation. We really appreciate your expertise. Well, thank and you for having me. <laughs> thank you. And we're also going to wish everybody a very happy and fulfilling and meaningful weekend. And we will see you at next month's webinar. Okay. Bye.